I'm Alice Banks here with BBC World News, our top stories. Crimea votes in a referendum on breaking away from Ukraine and joining Russia. These are live pictures from the regional capital, Simferopol, where polls have just opened. So do stay with us for that. But in the meantime, let's head back to our top story. Today, of course, is the day of the crucial referendum in Crimea. These are live pictures of a polling station in Simferopol, which is the uh, capital of the uh, Crimean uh, region. Polling stations there have just opened. And let's talk to our correspondent, Ben Brown, who's in uh, Simferopol for us. Uh, ben, uh, polls have been opened uh, for about 10 minutes now. Uh, what's turnout been like where you are? The vast majority are going to be voting to join Russia. Because, of course, crucially, Ben, there is no option on this ballot paper to retain the status quo, is there? First, there's now the leaders of the world's top industrialised nations have jointly condemned Russia for what they say is its clear violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. And they've put preparations for June's G8 summit in Russia on hold. Officials in Washington say that Russian forces have now taken complete control of the southern Ukrainian region of Crimea. Meanwhile, European Union foreign ministers are due to meet in emergency sessions in Brussels later. Philippa Young has the latest. Well, Steve Rosenberg is in Moscow for us and he joins me live now. Steve, increasingly strong words of condemnation really coming out from the international community, particularly from John Kerry, who we were just hearing from. How is Moscow reacting to this? Well, meanwhile, in Kiev, the Russian former oil tycoon Mikhail Khodorkovsky has spoken to crowds on Independence Square. He said that Russia had been complicit in police violence against the protesters. Well, let's get more now from Alexandra Nekrasov, a former Kremlin advisor. He's on the line and joins me live now from London. Many thanks for joining me here on the programme, Mr Nekrasov. If I could just begin with those words of Mikhail Khodorkovsky, I'd like to ask you what you make of them. He said that Russia had been complicit in police violence against the protesters and that Russia's recent actions inside Ukraine did not represent all Russians, that there was, in fact, a completely different Russia here. Well, it's very strange. Now, just one day to go, of course, until the people of Crimea vote on whether to remain in Ukraine or join Russia. Ukraine and the West are against the referendum, but talks between the US and Russia have failed. And overnight, there were clashes in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, leaving two people dead. Well, let's talk live now to the BBC's Ben Brown, who's in Simferopol in Crimea for us. Of course, Ben, where you are, we are less than 24 hours away from that crucial referendum. But elsewhere in the east of Ukraine, those violent clashes overnight. Ben Brown there for us in Simferopol in Crimea as the uh, region edges ever closer towards that uh, crucial referendum. BBC's John Simpson there. Well, let's cross over to Moscow now and speak to our correspondent Richard Galpin. Uh, Richard, uh, a delegation from uh, Crimea entered the upper house of the Russian parliament today. What kind of reception did they receive? that you talk about this legislation that's going to be read. One of the points being made in that is that a legal referendum must take place in a territory before it can be absorbed into the Russian Federation. The idea of legality, the interim government in Kiev might have a different interpretation of that. Oh, uh, a completely different uh, interpretation and already. Hey, Richard, many thanks for now. Richard Galpin there for us live in Moscow. Well, President Putin, uh, meanwhile, is at the opening ceremony of the Winter Paralympic Games, which is underway right now. With me is Erina Taranyuk of the BBC's Ukrainian service. Erina, it's almost difficult to remember in the midst of this political furore brewing in Crimea and in Ukraine that there is this celebration of sporting prowess happening in Sochi, over which President Putin is presiding, and at which Ukrainian athletes have decided they will go him uh, have this luxury and it's almost been a, a, an unfair and impossible position to put the Ukrainian athletes into over this pitting their love of country against their love of sport and even though they have decided to attend they've made this very strong statement as you've been saying at the opening ceremony and also the head of the team uh, Valery uh, Sushkevich has said that if anything major happens Ukraine will leave the games immediately what did he mean by that? Uh, Alice 
What I hope he meant is win the medals for Ukraine. Precisely, make those four years of hard training all the worthwhile. Uh, Irina, many thanks for coming and talking to us. Irina Taranyuk there from the BBC's Ukrainian show. So let's take a look at this internal wrangling and what strings will be attached to any IMF-led bailout and talk to an expert on the region. With me now is Andy Hunter, director of the Ukrainian Institute in London. Good to talk to you. I was saying there that any IMF bailout to Ukraine will come with conditions of reform. Is this an economy that needs reforming? Reforms. Because we know that Russia is no longer going to allow it to enjoy this discount that it's had for several years. We also know it's going to hit it with several fines from Gazprom and Neftegas and yes. some others as well. You talked about the fact that these uh, reforms have been needed for the past 20 years because it wasn't that long ago that the Ukrainian economy was des being described as more as an oligarchy. What is the role of the oligarchs in Ukraine and its economy? I mean, it, it, Ukraine for, for the oligarchs in this new society. And just uh, the other day, we had a, a very well-known oligarch within Ukraine, the industrialist Dmitry Firtash, being arrested uh, in Vienna. Some are describing this as a message from America, because it was the FBI that arrested him, as a message from America to Russia about Putin's use of petropolitics in this whole dispute. Absolutely. I mean, the increase in gas prices for, for domestic consumption. Yeah, we've not had time to talk about corruption, have we? We will have to wait and see if and when this IMF bailout is agreed and what terms are attached to it and what sort of reforms that will lead to within the Ukrainian economy. Uh, Andy Hunter, fascinated to talk to you. Many thanks. Thank you. Investors are expected to have moved more than 70 billion US dollars worth of assets out of Russia within the first three months of this year. It's the clearest sign yet that events in Crimea have raised fears about the future of the Russian economy. And with the prospect of tougher economic sanctions on the horizon, there's concern that there could be even more capital flight. Well, there are also warnings of stagnant growth and rising inflation inside Russia. Not good news for a country that grew by just 1.3% last year. Well, uh, joining me now to discuss Russia's ailing economy and the impact of sanctions is Wolfgang Manchow. He's the co-founder and director of Euro Intelligence. And he joins me live now from our Oxford studio. Many thanks for joining us, Wolfgang. Uh, 70 billion US dollars, that's a big number and it's bigger the many in Russia were expecting, even uh, Mr. Putin's senior economic advisor, Alexei Kudrin. How serious would you say that the situation is for Russia at the moment? Oh, there's... Volkan, as you say, all of this even before official sanctions have been uh, announced, and particularly worrying seems to be these reports that German companies, of course one of the biggest sources for foreign direct investment inside Russia, are already beginning to repatriate some of their profits. How worrying is that specifically for Russians? Now the economy right now. And Wolfgang, we're also hearing rumours that Russia might be kicked out of the uh, G8. We already know from the US side that the G7 is going to meet in Brussels in June rather than that scheduled meeting in Sochi. How big uh, or significant a snub is this for Russia? And they, they decided to meet without Putin. That's essentially what happened now. Which is, of course, a point that Putin and uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, have been keen to make as well. Um, Wolfgang, for now, many thanks for joining us and giving us your analysis on this situation in Russia at the moment. Uh, well, let's move on to a very different kind of story now. Uh, well, joining us now to talk through all those stories is Ravi Matti, deputy editor of the Financial Times Weekend magazine. Ravi, morning, Ravi. Morning. We're going to be talking about the uh, Oscars in just a of moment. Uh, but let's first of all talk about Ukraine because it is dominating the newspapers again this morning. Unsurprisingly, what's your take on what's happening? What do you think we're going to see from Moscow today in terms of reaction? Well, that is the million dollar question. And I think obviously with the West bringing that and out as well. this picture on the front cover of the independent newspaper really goes to the heart of the problem in Crimea in particular, because the picture shows Ukrainian soldiers trying to prevent Russians uh, the Russian military from entering this particular military place and yet the story predominantly out of Crimea is that it is in large parts a pro-Russian region there's a large number of Russian nationals and we've seen lots of sound bites and pictures of people there welcoming the presence of Russian soldiers so this is interesting isn't it that this is the picture that they're choosing to show from Crimea yeah absolutely and just as a social media champion but this is such an important crossroads for Moscow isn't it the Paralympics in Sochi begin on yeah. Friday the G8 begins in June we're already hearing from the G7 nations that many are considering mm. boycotting that event that would be 
very significant. Exactly. I mean, we had some major boycotts already. OK, let's move on to your paper, if you like, the right. FT. Let's talk about Bitcoin and the UK scrapping tax on Bitcoin. Does that mean that they now think it's a currency? Is that how they're going to classify it? And is that a surprise to you, considering the number of questions that still surround Bitcoin? Well, European Union foreign ministers are meeting in Luxembourg to discuss Ukraine. Well, the EU and the United States have already imposed some sanctions on Moscow following its annexation of Crimea. And new targeted economic sanctions are a sure bet to be on the agenda. Well, today, the Russian stock markets and the ruble fell after clashes between pro-Russian forces and the Kiev authorities in eastern Ukraine. Well, our economics correspondent, Andrew Walker, is here to tell us more. Andrew, how have the markets in Russia already been reacting to what's going on? How have the, the RTS and the MISEX been reacting? The, the what's going on next door. As you intimated there, of course, what markets hate more than anything mm. is uncertainty. Mm. And uh, we do have EU foreign ministers meeting in Luxembourg yeah. today. What do you think we're going to hear out of those talks? Well, I don't think so far. Well, let's talk about yeah. that because, of course, within the EU, certain countries, thinking specifically of Germany yeah. here, enjoy a much closer economic mm. relationship with Russia than others. So how likely is it that the EU, as a cohesive whole, would really be able to agree on any sort of meaningful sanctions against Russia? Well, it is striking that since there. All eyes on Luxembourg to see what Absolutely. comes out of those talks. Andrew, always good to talk to you. Andrew uh, Walker, there, our economic correspondent. Bring us up to speed with what's happening. <laughs> Militants now occupy government buildings in at least 10 cities in eastern Ukraine. The deadline at which the Ukraine government in Kiev said it would launch a, quote, large-scale anti-terrorist operation against them came and went today. So what are the prospects for even wider sanctions against Russia? Let's cross now to Bristol to join uh, Dr. Dara McDool from the Strategic Risk Analysis at Maplecroft. Many thanks for joining us here on the programme. Catherine Ashton there outlining in very broad terms what these wider sanctions uh, might entail. Looking at the specifics, though, how badly could a widening of these sanctions hurt the Russian economy? As you say, right now, these sanctions targeting just individuals. But is there a possibility that this could develop into a full-blown trade war? Absolutely. I mean... Indeed, one analyst I was speaking to recently described the economy there as, as more close to an oligarchy, really, than a, a functioning economy in many ways. Uh, but when we think about these eastern cities like Donetsk, like Kharkiv, looking at a possible uh, separation of them away from Ukraine, is this a very different story to the annexation of Crimea? It's an extremely different story. 